Hello, everyone. You're listening to Speaking of Art School, an oral history project created to perpetuate the legacy and culture of the San Francisco Art Institute. I'm your host, Thomas Houston. Thanks for listening. Hello, everyone. My name is Thomas Houston, and I want to welcome you to episode 10 of Speaking of Art School. I am a uh, alumni from San Francisco Art Institute, class of 1984, and this podcast series is in its second year, and today we are going to be featuring alumni Mike Henderson. He's in the room right now. Hey, how's it going? I'm good. How are you? All right. Nice to see you. Yeah, yeah, a long time. Uh, All right. I'm I'm super excited and uh very appreciative of your participating in this interview series. And uh I just wanted to really thank you for that. I know a little bit about you. You uh you were born in Mississippi and came oh, to Missouri. In Missouri. Okay. So I don't know as much as I thought. Uh, uh, there's not much difference politically. <laughs> you know. That's awesome. <laughs> so you came to San Francisco in 1965 and graduated uh, from the Art Institute with your master's in 1970. Yeah. And uh, so I'll just, uh, I'll let you take it away with a little background about who you were as a as a young kid coming to San Francisco and, and you can elaborate on that and and then I've got a few other questions, and we've got some pictures, and we're going to have a good time. Yeah, I'm excited. Anytime time I get a chance to talk about my school. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, so what what was happening with you uh, that brought you to San Francisco and, and then to the Art Institute? Oh, just chasing a dream, you know, trying to do something that... Uh, other than uh, live down the street from, uh, you know, from my parents and die, mm. and go to church with them. You know, it's like that's what you do in a small town, you know, right. in the neighborhood, you know, especially back down in the South with the uh, Black community poor, you know, everybody's sort of like, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to get out because, um, you know, in some situations, people want to pull you down to keep you there. They don't want to see you leave mm -hmm. you know, or something like, that. I don't know, whatever. There's, of course, there's there's some of that there, you know, and, you know, and you got to take care of your family, you know, and stuff like this. And, uh, and you just, uh, and some people, um, some people do, everybody doesn't taste a dream, you mm -hmm. know. Right. I was stupid enough to want to be different, you know. There you go. Because I was already different, you know. I just I thought a little bit sideways, and uh, it came up really early in my life. That's and, great. But the only thing I liked, I, I, ha I hated school. And um, and I was, I was living with my grandmother, and, uh, you know, and... I just, I just, I like just being around her. I thought that's all I needed to know, you know. Uh -huh. so then when they send me off to the school, oh yeah. man. Uh, Not wow. only that, but was confusing, but we had no indoor water or plumbing. So when I got to the school, there was bathrooms. <laughs> to my wow. First day. I had to go home, change clothes because I didn't know where to go. Oh, <laughs> wow. Wow. So, like I said, again, you know, it just was, uh, it just didn't fit me, you know, and I, uh -huh. didn't, and I didn't, I didn't know how to play, you know, because I've been around my grandparents and older people her age all the time, preaching yeah. and so forth. So uh, I, um, I, I was never around uh, anybody my age, you know, because we lived in out of, sort of out of, out of city limits, you know, uh -huh. but anyway, um, I have this, I was just fascinated by pictures. Uh-huh. Uh, my mother used to work for this family, and then they would give us uh, the Look in Time magazines and posts, whatever, you know. And I remember seeing the Norman Rockwell covers. And I was just, plus comic books, too. I was fascinated how these guys uh, 
um, you know, looked like when you looked at it, you were looking up something way up in the air, or you're looking down on a building in a city. How did they do that? How mm -hmm. did they do that? How did that, you know, it was just like, I would just stare at it for hours, you know. That's and, awesome. Uh, you know, not, same way with the textbooks. <laughs> uh -huh. You had a picture or something, you know, and everybody, everybody's finished reading, you, you know, 20 pages. I'm still looking at the cover of the book or something. Just, I would, you know, right. I, just, I was in the, I was different, like I said, again, and, and I just, uh, I just embraced it, you know, because I was unhappy any other way, you uh -huh. know. So when I um, found that there was uh, art schools, I happened to be working at this hotel, uh, like in Hotel in Marshall, and next door was uh, Miss Davis' uh, drugstore, and she had magazines, so every now and then I'd go in there. <laughs> <laughs> and look at the magazines until she said, don't look at the magazines. You know? Oh, man. Because everybody would come in there and look at them, never buy them. The pages get bent and everything. Right. So anyway, I remember picking up one called Art in America. And I saw that and I'm looking at it. I even bought a copy and I just looked at the pictures all the time and the p pictures and the paintings that were in it. And uh, then I was, uh, then I remember looking in the back where the ads were. And one day I noticed in this magazine there were art schools and I couldn't believe it, you know, and I'd already quit high school because I just didn't fit in. So, mm -hmm. you know, so anyway, make a long story short, uh, when I saw that, I, I immediately started applying to them and some of them I'd get to and they wouldn't let me in because I was black. And the only oh, one wow. that accepted me was San Francisco Art Institute. Wow. Because I called him and told him that I was black. She says, I never forget this. Uh, the, the reception, she was a little puzzled, like, uh, 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 okay, uh, <laughs> you know. Right. <laughs> is, is there something I can help you with? Is there <laughs> like, I guess, like, you know, do you want to live in a whole black neighborhood or what? Or is there black schools? Or, you know, I wasn't concerned about that. Yeah, you know, right. Like people are now, you know, I just... I, if I had to be the first, I wanted to be the first. You know, there you that go. Mm -hmm. and my dream was so strong. I didn't need a role model to say, you know, well, has there been black artists? I learned all that stuff later, but I sure. did see uh, um, uh, one time a magazine that had a bunch of Charles White's drawings in it, mm -hmm. drawings, and I used to copy those. And, uh, you know, in religious scenes, too, you know, sure. yeah, all of that and uh, so forth. So uh, anytime I could get a book or go to Kansas City with my buddies or something, I'd see, hey, let's stop at the drugstore, you know, maybe I'll pick up some, you know, some ink or a piece of paper, some watercolors or something like that. Hadn't gotten to the oils at that point, uh -huh. but, it, you know, one thing led to another. Yeah. Then I came out here and I came out here first. I saved with money coming out here in 1965. Okay. Yeah. And it all fell apart on me. Aha. Uh -huh. I had to go back to Missouri and I knew what I needed to do. I needed more money. Ah, uh, yeah. You know? And uh, anyway, in 66, I came back, you know, and they still said, you know, that my app being accepted was still good. So, mm hmm. I just came back out here and determined to make it work with a, luckily I ran into some, uh, one of my shoe shine customers from the hotel, a guy named Leonard Van Dyke, had a friend who lived out here, uh, Mac McChesney and Mary McChesney. They lived in Petaluma. Aha. Uh -huh. He was an artist. And uh, anyway, uh, he told me if I ever got in, you know, trouble or needed help, I gave me a letter of recommendation to them and, uh, they, you know, contact information. So I was staying at the, uh, staying at the, 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 Y and, uh, and, uh, I was running out of money because uh, I didn't want to spend the tuition money I saved up, you know, Right. and I was about to break into that after about the two weeks stand. Mm. You know, and I was they'd already offered me a job. The school said, Yeah, you can get a job here. So anyway, on the maintenance crew. So I was excited about that. Awesome. And and uh so anyway, 
I uh, 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 this they got they uh, there was a family named the uh, Thoughtless Rudy and Thelma Thoughtless. She was Italian, he was Hungarian, and they took me in to their house just as a stranger. And uh, and then I found a place with a bunch of roommates and so forth. And, uh, you know, and things begin to work out. I, I had a, you know, all of a sudden the pieces were there, you yep. know, to me to put them together. And that's great. Do what I needed to do. And, you know, and then you get around other students at the Art Institute and you, uh, you find out how to survive and mm -hmm. with how, you know, and all of that stuff. And yes. Yeah. And then after that, it was like, uh, it was just cloud nine all the way, you know. That's great on top of the dream and and just loving it because uh there not only that but san francisco had so many art galleries mm -hmm. there used to be art galleries all up and down kearney street coming towards uh you know this they were selling tourist looking paintings but it didn't matter to sure. me the paintings and they were artists right and beach around uh where aquatic park is was on sundays and saturdays with a line with people and they were beach chairs with their watercolors and, you know, just, you know, having a good time selling their work or trying to get tours or it was, it was. Exactly. And music too. Oh uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and that sort of personified right out of the school too, because there was a, uh, there was a lot of music around the Art Institute at that time. You know? Awesome. And were you, uh, I know you're a musician and a filmmaker. Were you playing music when you came out to San Francisco originally? Uh, I, yes, I had a band in Marshall called the the Bluesman. Uh -huh. uh, was the lead singer, Galen Swift was the uh, lead guitarist. John Nicholas was uh, the uh, was the bass player, and uh, I can't remember the drummer's name. One of the drummers we liked playing with was a guy named Kelso. He was an incredible drummer, uh -huh. and I was rhythm guitar player. Awesome. I was. I was sort of like the organizer of the uh -huh. group. So when I, got out here, I was sort of forced to play lead. Okay. And sang. That was something I was never prepared to do. So uh, when I came out here, it was like, like I said, again, you walk down the street and there's somebody either with a painting or a guitar or whatever. It just was in the air all the time. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. But war was going on, Vietnam was going on, and there was protests and and hearing all these people speak up, you know, the Black Panthers, there were rallies uh, that they would have and so forth. And uh, and I would I would see a, a different type of Ar African American than I saw growing up. You mm -hmm. know? And uh, and uh, the language too, you know, yeah. I didn't hear that many MFs. <laughs> yeah. Where I grew up, you know, everybody was MF. Hey, motherfucker, what you doing? Right, right, right. <laughs> but anyway, uh, oh man, you know, every, it, you know, I had to change my, I had to change my, uh, my vocabulary too when I got here. So it was a complete change of everything, diet, because yeah. that was something else that was going on around the artist too. You, you know what you put in your body and all this humanity classes. Mm -hmm. and, art history and the different painting classes and talking to the different students and seeing different students from different cultures, you yeah. know, and so forth. And that's you great. Know, learning the difference, you know, between the, 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 all the different Asian cultures, not everybody's just Chinese or Japanese, you know, there's, yeah, there's Korean and so forth and Vietnamese and so, yeah, oh, yeah, you know, so Excellent. that yeah. kind of was uh, was exciting too. Like all of a sudden, you feel like you're part of the world. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, people, students who were very, from very wealthy families, or maybe they parents were artists and successful. You know, and you just you're around these people. Like I said again, and um, it just it just it, the whole atmosphere. Everybody changed the atmosphere there. Everybody was a part of the yeah. The at school so it just was contagious for creativity you That's know because awesome. yeah. yeah. there yeah yeah right especially the, yeah especially the humanities courses uh-huh that's you amazing know, that you you uh, <laughs> that's awesome that you came uh 
without even finishing high school, you you. No, I went, I went. I finished high school. Oh, you did. Okay, got it. When I found out that the art schools, there were art schools. Yeah, I, I called them and find out, and they said, "Well, they offer a degree." So they said, "So I said, can you get in without a uh, without a high school diploma?" And mm. some of them would say, "No," and yeah. some of them would say, "Yes." So we, you know, but you can't get a degree. Mm-hmm. And I said, "Well, what does the degree do? Well, that allows you to uh, be, you know, like an." Uh, an artist uh, 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 or a teacher or anything like mm-hmm. that. And that excited me. So all of a sudden, I had a reason to go back to school. That's I went awesome. I to school at t- around 21. Finished. I, there was one class that failed a seventh grade uh, uh, math class. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'd sat in the seats and I couldn't get out of the seats because I was too big. Oh, wow. <laughs> interesting yeah yeah so that was kind of you know you look around and there's my little brother behind me he's taking the class you know everybody else is the right age you know i'm like uh 19 or 20 you know yeah like 20 or 21 i mean but anyway uh yeah i knew that's what i had to do to to become an artist so i went back to high school then when i graduated and awesome was uh you know going now and I now and I got license to chase my dream. You there know, you like, go. That's fantastic. I didn't want I didn't want any excuses. I wanted to know if there was something in me or not. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to get there at the finish line and say, "Well, you don't have this." Yeah. You know, I wanted the ball to be in my hand and say, "Okay, I've got the I finished high school. I'm ready. I went to an art school. I graduated. You know, I came and did the work." I focused on what I wanted, you know, and so forth, and mm-hmm. was able to find out something about the world and that was out there and so forth. And if I uh, don't don't uh, make it as an artist or something, then I'll play the guitar. I'm not going go. back, you know, and so forth. Because I thought California was like uh, San Francisco is going to be like. Uh, <laughs> Like the Gidget movies at the beach. Oh man, right. Um, in the ocean and all that. And I came out here with cold as hell, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh my gosh. People That's not me to say, aren't you cold? I'm I was I thought it was warm, right? You know, yeah. I'm walking with a leaf shirt down Market Street, and somebody would eventually would say, Hey, aren't you cold? <laughs> That's awesome. Right, exactly. It's it's but anyway. It, it was it was uh, it was it was great. Plus, I lived in a mission, uh-huh. and you know, when you're around uh, 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 um, um, where I grew up, it was just black and white. Uh-huh. And I was living in the neighborhood where it's a little bit diversity. You know, there was a, a lot of Chicano families lived there, and so forth. and finding out about their culture, you know, yeah. and so and all the speeches. I went to hear Caesar Salvez speak, awesome. you know, and awesome. everybody. You know that that had something to say. You know, yeah. Uh, even uh, I was there when uh, when you know, what's his name, the poet Red Howe, Ginsburg. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah, there was a lot of poets hanging awesome. around the yard too, too at that time. You know. Yep. So it was That's... like it was very fertile. You see others who uh, you're in a community where everybody's chasing a dream. Mm-hmm. You're not football, you know. Then you gotta. Then you just it relaxes you in some sort of way, you know. Absolutely, and you got some encouragement from your from your family, from your grandma uh, or your parents to no. to bail out of there. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Like get the hell out of there. It was a waste <laughs> of time, you know. I had one aunt, my aunt sis. Um, when I quit school at sixteen, I went to live with them in Springfield, Illinois, and she let me set up my studio in the basement. And there was this, uh, there was an African American man there who was an uh, artist who they knew. His name was Harm Jackson. There's several people. I guess there was some guy who went to the artist at one time with the same name, but different spelling. Mm-hmm. But anyway, um, he was he was sort of noted around there because he did ads for the newspaper. He did uh, Jet Magazine, Ebony Magazine, Black uh-huh. Magazine. The ads he did the layouts and very good painter, and uh, he lived near my aunt, 
and they uh, they asked him, would he take a look at my drawings? And, you know, so forth. So he was like, the I would say, the first um, artist I ever met. Yeah. Other than, I did go to a summer session at the Kansas City Art Institute one summer when I was trying to get credits to graduate from high school. Uh-huh. At a summer session, and the lady I worked for, Miss Freeman, she let me, uh, she let me go for the uh, for the four or five weeks it was, and told me if that's what I wanted to do, she would pay me the same salary. All I had to do is come home on the weekends and clean the hotel and do all the stuff. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, then after that and so forth, but. So that was a big help too, but I awesome. was, uh, I was, I was, it was, it was sort of, it was a, it was a real struggle there because uh, yeah, it wasn't welcomed. You know, uh -huh. that was the I could talk to, but I had to carry a letter around, you know, specifying that I'm going to school, and I had to carry a letter showing that I could eat at this restaurant or shop at this grocery store mm -hmm. or whatever. And the cops would stop me when they I'd go for a walk on a Sunday, you know, I get pulled over three or four times, <laughs> you know. Oh man. So I I had to show them the letter, you know. Right. Oh and, man. Right. It was it was it was like I said again. So when I got to San Francisco, it was like a San Francisco was entirely different. Mm -hmm. They yeah. were not, you know, everything, you know. And uh that was you know that does something to you. You mm -hmm. know, absolutely. The chance to say something about it, which, which I learned that painting was a voice for that. And Fred Martin's art history class, he when he talked about Goya and some mm -hmm. of these art, so forth, and and the, and and their lives and their lives and what was going on in their lives and yeah. you know, regardless every artist that he talked about struggled at one time mm -hmm. about whether they were from a wealthy family or or whatever you know or poor family it just it just uh it just seemed like that was a part of life now you you know what are, what are your struggles mike and right and so forth yeah yeah and uh then when like i said again you, you just you realize that there's a voice for that that you know that you don't feel comfortable talking about it or you can't express in words mm -hmm. painting was not just drawing something and coloring it in anymore yeah right like what it was if you want to be a photorealist that's whatever you know right you, if there's another thing that's um pulling at you it's it's um it's then you you got to create it yourself you know and so forth yep and right. That was something too that I uh, I got a little bit more in depth with uh, when uh, once one summer the I think maybe the second year there I got a scholarship to go to Skowhegan, Maine. Uh huh. And I was there, and it was that summer, and I met uh, um, and the teachers. Jason jo Jacob Lewis was there. Philip Pearlstein. Uh huh. Were uh, and a bunch of others I can't remember. And and plus, uh, they had these visiting artists come in and talk. Buckminster spoke for uh, eight hours straight. Oh wow! You know? Awesome. Was, was <laughs> oh yeah, and, that's uh, great. Roy Lichtenstein was there, uh -huh. you know, and 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 all the students was a different type of student on the East Coast that was yeah. there. I, I think there was somebody uh, from a couple other people from California. And myself, everybody else there was from the East Coast and the Midwest and so forth, and some people from uh, from Canada uh -huh. and, and forth. But that's uh, awesome. So we had a different, uh, there was a different dialogue there, and around all these New York artists, and I could all of a sudden I could see the difference, you know, between the 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 dialogue and 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 the work too you know right yeah yeah you know, especially when Roy Lichtenstein uh, gave his lecture and he talked about you know like having workers mm -hmm. you know help do the work just you know 
And, and that was, uh, I knew that all those Renaissance painters that do those um, big murals, they had helpers to mix right. paint or whatever. But anyway, just hearing somebody say that, you know, mm -hmm. it's different when you, when you hear about it in history, but all of a sudden when you hear it, it's happening now, you think about stuff differently, you mm. know. You Absolutely. Now, I, um, I guess I can just open up another uh, uh, a channel to to pull from, you yeah. know, in terms of inspiration. Yeah, that's and right. That was, that was, that was, uh, that was a, so when I came back to San Francisco, I had a lot of questions about this and that and so mm -hmm. forth. Uh, I remember there was a student there, um, she's a friend of my roommate, so... Uh, she was sort of a tomboy because she was all. They were always challenging each other to race, swim across the park, the lake there, and this guy he so Oh forth. wow, yeah. He would beat her sometimes. She would beat him or stuff. Anyway, I sort of liked that and watching them out the window. And uh, and uh, one day we had a night there scouting where everybody showed what they did before they came there. Uh huh. Uh, she showed a film of uh, that she made. They had films at the Art Institute, but I didn't really pay yeah. that much. I was focused on painting, nothing else but painting. You uh -huh. know, I, other people who did stuff. You know, George Oxier, Dennis Hearns, and so forth. Uh, that were photographers. Mm -hmm. All the people I bombed a million dollars a quarter with. <laughs> Photographers always had the extra quarter I could get or the 15 cents I need to ride the bus. Oh, no, that's great. <laughs> I was that's... always broke. Uh... <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, the, um, when she, in the film, they, they family cook. It was a black woman. And anyway, she had her a sort of like went through the house or whatever, walking around the house or whatever it was. And that caught my eye because it was the first time I've ever seen a black woman on the film that wasn't playing uh, some degraded role or mm -hmm. something. Stereotyping of uh, right, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Southern woman is or whatever, you know. So anyway, um, uh, um, when I got then then Dr. King got killed. Mm -hmm. I went down to the rally there the Civic Center, listening to the speeches, and I remember walking back to the school because I was working on my painting, took a break, walked down there, and I was walking back, and I was thinking about my painting when I got in front of it again. And I said to myself, these protest paintings could uh, have more power if they could move. My figures could move. Uh -huh. I thought about filmmaking in my life, yeah. you know? And I was sort of uh, I was sort of at the end of doing these protest paintings because I was I was at a place I had never been before because all of a sudden I was questioning like why am I painting another one of these paintings? Mm -hmm. you no, know, and all of a sudden is are you doing that because you get attention or you think you might get attention or you know what I mean? Yeah. So right. these types of things start coming up. And, you know, and then, you know, you start talking to other faculty members who are artists and, and you know, is this something that you, you know, that, where did this come from? Yeah. You know, yeah. Or it's in, uh, and you realize there's another, there's another thing called, you know, when you get galleries and career, mm. and, which I never thought about, you know, yeah. I would just, I could paint. Yep. And each each time you run into a wall, it seems like when you get over that wall or through it, uh, there is it's it's never it doesn't seem to be a dead end. It just seems to be another road mm -hmm. you know, start over again. So all of this new stuff that you got to mentally figure out and start thinking about and all of this stuff. Yep. And right. So anyway. Um, I thought about making a film and thought about that and put the figures. Then all of a sudden, then, you know, what are you going to paint? You know, uh, I, you know, now, now all of those things from art history lecture, 
when Fred was talking about, um, you know, uh, the color field painters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how color has effect on people and painting and shapes and so forth. And always, all of a sudden, there's a different vocabulary that 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 these these things bring up to you. Absolutely, and that was something I began to uh, to explore, and that's when my painting changed. Uh -huh. and I making films. I didn't know how I was going to make films or anything. I knew the first. Um, <laughs> I was coming to school one morning <laughs> on my way to school. <laughs> Didn't break the teacher's room, but I uh, was riding a cable car because the cable car was always a great way to go to the Art Institute. Yeah, right. You hide street, you walk down the hill, you go Powell Street, you walk up the hill. So that's the only decision you want to make. Yep. But you get to see, you know, coming through uh knob hill or chinatown just a different you're like wow this is a different world there's the bay out there the ocean right the, the rest of the world and you know and you see everything it just it was so yeah it was just like exciting like a like a double shot of a, a drilling on uh -huh. there you, see you that, go you know and, and if there was always tourists and you hear they talk and so forth and mm -hmm. how fascinated they are about this or that or whatever or what what they don't like about it or something and you know you, you sort of uh you know take it all in and that Absolutely. was always, even on the bus when i take the 30 stockton sometimes when i had to get here quicker or something but anyway um coming through uh leaving the mission coming through chinatown was like going through these different uh countries or something mm -hmm. you know? And that was exciting to me. And uh, I, uh, every day when I got off, got there at school. By the time I got there, I had some, I had enough inspiration to start a painting. So, two, yeah. two of whatever. I was just jacked. And one morning, That's I take a cable car, and a truck backs into it and knocks me off. Wow. <laughs> and, and I'm laying on the ground. And so anyway, they called an ambulance, took me to the hospital. So the first thing they say is, who should we call? And I go, oh, my God, you know, who should he call? I can't call my parents. They said, leave him there. You know? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> so what am I going to do? It serves him right for going over and doing that stupid thing. I want to be an artist. But uh, anyway, I I said, call the Art Institute. <laughs> you know? yeah. That was my family, you know. Sure. One of the trustees came, a guy named Chauncey McKeever. He comes in there. In the hospital where they had me in this ward, I was kind of dazed, and you know, all of a sudden, sure, you know, and this allowed me to think while I was there, what if I had been crippled and had to go back to Missouri and live with my parents? Oh man, you know, you know so that thought enters, you know, like all of a sudden, sure. my day changed, you know, my thought patterns change. So, anyway, you, you think about all that stuff. Then this guy shows up, Chauncey McKeever, and the people at the hospital, after two seconds when he's in there, they thought that I was a king or something from some from some place or something. Oh, wow. Private room and all of this. And yeah. Worth getting attention. I would just land there on a gurney. But anyway, um, he says, don't worry about a thing. I'll take care of everything. Yeah. So anyway, I went to the doctors, all that stuff. And the next day I come to school, uh, the secretary tells me there's a message for me to call this guy, and I called him. He was the office was in the Bank of uh, America down there in the uh, financial district. So he told me to come down there. He had something for me, and I get there, and it's like a check for about two thousand dollars. Wow! So all of a sudden, I you know I go put it in the bank, put a hundred. I think I put a hundred dollars in my pocket or something, or I was gonna buy some shoes and some pair of pants or mm -hmm. something, or whatever it was, or bar of soap or toilet yeah. paper. Roommates. <laughs> there God. you go. Yep. <laughs> so anyway, um, oh man. So, and there was a paper I had to write for Fred's art history class. Mm -hmm. We all went to this place, the uh, De Young Museum, to see this show. And I saw these Tebow paintings there. 
uh, watermelon stands. Of course, that's something I grew up with. Was all of a sudden Fred says, "Oh okay, yeah, what you view of the show?" Yeah. So the people I was with, Helen Stanley and Bob Combs and a few other people. Yeah. Justin Spoon, whatever. Anyway, I said, uh, "What's the what's the review?" <laughs> You know, you got to write what you feel about the painting. Yeah. You know, how do I, what do I feel about the painting? You know, oh, that wow. was so. Anyway, I was wondering how to do this, and thinking of my high school days, uh, school days, I decided, you know, there's nobody in front of me I can copy. <laughs> you know, dig over the shoulder, see what they're writing. Yeah. Well, um, he, this uh, then I saw a sculpture. I was thinking about, well, I grew up with watermelon stands. I saw them thinking about that. Well, that's not a review. You're talking about yourself. They kept telling me, you know, mm -hmm. you, you know. Uh, so anyway, what the painting mean to you or whatever. So anyway, I go to the other part and I see these sculptures by um, uh, Robert Hudson. They okay. Another sculpture, and and they paint it. And every time there were convex stuff, it was painted concave and vice versa. You know? Yeah. And this excited me because I was struggling with sculpture. Aha. Uh -huh. Never did understand three dimensional. Any stretcher bar I build is crooked. That's great. But uh, that's why I never could be a realistic painter. Uh huh. <laughs> you know? Uh, classical guitars, but anyway, um, uh, that excited me, and I was, and they told me, well, this guy te teaches at school at night school at the school. So uh -huh. since I'm at the school, I figured I'd go up there and hang around that night. And since I got the money in my pocket, and I would, uh, I was going to see if I could meet him and and find out what his work was about. Little I didn't know that Bob Hudson was later was a man of like three words, maybe. Oh wow. <laughs> So anyway, I see this guy who looks like the picture I saw of him turned out to be Robert Nelson. Okay. And I said, are you Bob Hudson? He says, no, I'm Robert Nelson. And he says, is there anything you can you can help me with? I can help you with? And I said, no. I saw his sculptures and I wanted to talk to him about it. And he says, well, I'm not him. I said, well, what do you teach? He said, filmmaking. And I said, hey, I want to make a film. Awesome. He said, the camera? I said, no. Uh, and I swear to God, at the moment, this woman walks up, this woman named Ann Hatch, I'll never forget. And she uh, says to him, Bob, you know anybody want to buy a camera? And he said, he does. Okay. I said, how much you want for it? And she said, I want 150. Hmm. And um, I said, okay. Uh, and Bob, took the camera and looked at it and said, yeah, this is a good buy. You ought to buy it. You got the money. And I said, sure. So I rested in my pocket, gave her 150 bucks and bought awesome. it. Do you know how to load it and get film? I, no, I don't know anything about it. Great. So anyway, the long yeah. story short, that's how I got into filmmaking. And that's when the paintings changed because uh, the figures were much more uh, interesting as a filmmaker you could make a figure go forward, you make it go backward. You could turn it upside down. You could right. it with all these things. You could. You, it was like making sculpture, actually, filmmaking. Awesome. I think yeah. uh, we've got some pictures that uh, that I could share right here too. I, you were mentioning that watermelon painting, uh, yeah. and uh, let me just uh, open this up and we'll look at uh, some pictures. My supper. That painting is called. And uh, yeah, let's go over here and uh, I'll just open, I'm just gonna open this up right here. Okay. And we'll be able to see, uh, see that if I was, can find. That was one of the first paintings I did there that really uh, 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 began to make painting, figure painting open up. Aha, uh -huh. so yeah. I put myself in the painting as a guitar player uh huh. Piano player and uh, and uh, the, you know the club scene something I was was familiar seeing so I wasn't because figure painting didn't make any sense to me. Uh huh. Painting a model there it yeah. just you know it wasn't me and I was struggling with it. Then I just sort of uh, 
that I did made made them up out of my head. And this oh, okay. Was, yeah. One of the first. Yeah, let's see here. That's it. There we go. Now this painting uh came to me uh again from another uh sort of mental source. Hey, I'd went home uh that the first that uh after a semester here and uh I wanted to um, coming back. I didn't know. I didn't know how my, you know, I'm gonna if I could finish this second, sure. year, then I was gonna have a year in. Yeah. Then then I maybe could apply for government loans, but you, I couldn't. I wasn't a resident of California. Had to be here for a year before you get qualified for a loan. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know about scholarships the first year, so I didn't apply for any. So anyway. Uh, Coming back through Utah, I was back in Missouri, and I couldn't, I couldn't uh, marshal there. And I left um, a couple of days before New Year's Eve. And when I got to, um, when I got to Utah, it was New Year's Eve, and it was around about four o'clock. And I was just, uh, you know, excited to get back to school. Because I had the keys to the school, I was on the maintenance crew. Of course, I had the keys. Yeah, sure. Everybody still was going to be on vacation, and I wanted to stretch up the biggest painting I've ever did, okay. and I've ever painted. And, uh huh. And because it was like, now go for broke. See if it's something. Because you, you're on your last leg here, you know. Right. So you want to do something that you've never done before. So I, uh, I thought about well, what is the painting is going to be. And I thought about the thing that I really struggled with growing up was uh, was the picture of uh, of Jesus being white. Aha, uh -huh. sure. Mm -hmm. and growing up and hearing, you know, you know, why is God treating us this way? You know, then you know, then I've been out here and been around the the dialogue out here now is, you know, the, the about subliminal images. Aha, uh -huh. yeah. You know, so anyway, I was thinking about that and so forth about, you know, I knew growing up, I could never ask anybody, you know, why are we sitting here, you know, poor, <laughs> poverty with the worst resources and, and the and the person we wishing up, wishing uh, on is, uh, is white. Is white. Mm -hmm. The person that's persecuted, <laughs> you know, why? You know, if there is a God, why, why are we praying to Him? You know? Yeah, and so forth. So, so you know, I mean, out here, all of a sudden, Eastern philosophy came in when I got out here. So I had these questions in my head, like I said, driving back. I'm thinking about all this. So anyway, so I thought, okay, my painting is going to be about the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. You know, and my version of it. Yeah. So forth and. Uh, because I'm hearing all this stuff from Christians, just how uh, you know awful black people are, people of color are anyway. So, like you know, then if the you know how can this religion <laughs> preach peace and happiness to me and 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 preach yeah. anger to these people, you know? Right. So, way, I all of these things are like shards of ideas that hadn't been connected. But that's one of the reasons with an artist, the only way you can express this, these different things is, is is to make work about them, show them what you do if you're a writer, dancer, a musician, whatever, whatever your voice is. Right. Verbal, you know, if you were, then you, you know, write about it if you were a writer. But anyway, that was that was the painting I had to took over the grad, uh, took over the studio, moved everything out of there. And put up my painting, brought in my music, and had the school for probably about a uh, half a week or more. Awesome. Around. And how the, how big was this is this painting then? Uh, I think it was um, one one side might be because of it. This makes it look even because hey, I I stretched the stre I I built a stretcher bar and stretched it myself. Yeah. Uh, probably twelve feet or something. Awesome, that's and, great. Uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit shorter than six feet. You know, yeah. they, they put the, you know, had to cut off the ends there and so yep. forth. So anyway, it was the largest I ever did, 
and they got bigger from there because uh, I just I realized all of a sudden when Fred Martin mentioned in art history class the, about brush strokes, mm -hmm. talking about different artists, and he was saying to be an artist, you know, make to be able to make a brush stroke your body size. Yes, right. Of course, I, of course, I think it's you know my wingspan, right? Right. So, I wanted, I hadn't explored that, and that was something I wanted to do, my style. Brush. Yeah. And absolutely. First time I, you know, sort of like, uh, uh, sort of got into what I was doing back in Missouri with paint. When somebody wanted a Jackson Pollock paint, you know, Mike, can you make me a paint? You yeah. Know, for my dorm or something, I would, you know, drink. But, but all of a sudden, I, I was able to integrate it into what I was doing. And this painting must have changed a thousand times, man. Uh huh. This That's was the way that it sort of came up. It just all came together at the end, you know. So everything was, uh, was, uh, was, was just there, you know. That's awesome. Getting the getting courage to let it come through you. Sure, you know? absolutely. Like uh, I see some people say, you know. Uh, well, I was embarrassed or this or that or about that. I'd be too embarrassed or ashamed to say that or do this or that. Yeah. Or what are people going to think? And um, I just I just never was that concerned about that dialogue. You mm -hmm. know? So whatever, I I because I, I didn't think anybody was ever going to see these things but me anyway, you know. Right, right. Painting for audience because... That was something people would say to, well, who's your audience? Who's your audience? You know, and who you're, you know, like, oh, hell, I don't know. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> who is, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to gonna go through some of these. So would you say that um, at, the, at that time, there was a, there might have been a particular aesthetic of the school, uh, figurative expressionism possibly I mean, or I, I, you know personally when i heard that when they heard the figurative these were a bunch of uh people who in paintings that sat around in chairs and posed yeah i didn't see people that way i saw them more like i saw when i was inspired by the van gogh show i saw uh -huh. in the fields with a box arch i saw you know my grandmother and her friends and so forth and people working in the in the gardens and and field work like I did too growing up right weeds out of bean fields and the hay fields sure and those bean fields the the the, the um, a roll of beans might be a half a mile or a quarter mile and you got to bend over yep you know, and uh, and uh, and and pull all the weeds out without pulling up the beans because otherwise the, you have to walk back to town. All right. this had to be done before uh, uh, noon because the sun would get too hot. Yeah. So I was used to seeing people doing things. So when they would talk to me about the Bay Area figure paintings and all that, it just sort of went over my head. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Do stuff. That's why the music painting, like I say, to me playing to get that sort of broke me away from like. Why am I here trying to paint the, uh, you know, the breast or the butt or whatever of right. this to make it look like that? You know, mm -hmm. I remember Scott Higgins, Philip Perlstein was there too, and I talked a lot with him, and he said his his objective was at the beginning was try to make the camera obsolete, and I thought about oh that's interesting he'd say that yeah. so I think there was a contact for it by then you know when I went there and I was. You know, but when I was doing these, it was just following my own lead and uh, trying to figure out how to make the figure work for me. Yeah, absolutely. And when I got to the Scow Hegan, everybody <laughs> said, you're a West Coast figurative painter. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, my paintings are different than all those people. <laughs> I'm setting chairs and poles <laughs> and stand around. Right. Uh, in an environment is... Uh, oh, that's great. Some who were who, painters did you know yeah who were some of your uh more notable uh uh painting instructors that you got some well, encouragement like, from even the ones who didn't encourage me i learned uh, yeah something from them you know that's for sure i i can yeah. totally relate to that 
it might have not been immediately, it might have been something that it didn't fit in, but by the time I was teaching at Davis, then those thoughts came in out of the, you know, the computer here, which is <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we've repaired this age. <laughs> but uh but you know, once I, I talked to anybody, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't just somebody that I um that I was taking class from. If I saw yeah. them, teacher or somebody who I thought worked there I didn't even know if they talked painting I said what do you think yeah you know? that's so, great and yeah uh, that's one awesome that was one uh uh I talked to quite a bit uh Bruce McGall Sam Chikalian yeah mm -hmm. uh, uh Joan Brown uh Bill Geist, who was a sculpture teacher, I probably talked to him more than I talked to painting teachers. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I realized with him that it was all about just art. It wasn't didn't matter the didn't matter the tool. Right. Whether it was a brush or saw or whatever or, or film or whatever. It was just it was just, you know, it was the artist. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then uh, at a certain point. Uh, I understand your you went more into abstraction. Is that true? Yes. Uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because there's a painting I did at Skowhegan when I was when I was where I first started questioning, like uh, why am I doing figure paintings? That was my uh, when I left to go there. That was my whole thing too. Was to spend that summer trying to work that out. Right. And and, uh, and <laughs> I showed up uh, a week and a half before the school opened in, in Skowhegan, Maine. Oh, wow. It caused a lot of confusion. But uh, yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, and I remember everybody walking down the street and everybody was reading In Cold Blood by Truman Capote then. You know? Okay. Uh huh. The book they were reading. And uh, it was, yeah, it was a different environment. Yeah, they had a wow. there's a sort of a southern accent they had, and meeting students from back there too. But anyway, I was working with Philip Perlstein, so I said to him about he was talking about figurative painting and so forth. Hey, maybe you want to work on this, and you know. So I did this one painting called Freedom when I was there, working with the ideas he's had of bringing more clarity to stuff. And I realized that one night I was in there painting that oh my god. This 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 is not me. Yeah, you know, and so anyway, uh, that's that weekend when everybody went away, I had this studio to myself. So I got two big canvases and I put them together, and and I uh, went in there and I started, you know, just start using my emotions, what I felt. And I also used the limited palette because that was something that I picked up from Fred's art history class about uh -huh. work and so forth. How could this guy got so much out of a color? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I, I was thinking about color fields and all these things. I learned about color and shape now. So anyway, I do this painting. Monday morning, I come and I get Mr. Perlstein. I said, Mr. Perlstein, I did a painting and absolutely no figures. I drip painting. And I splattered it, <laughs> sort of like the background in uh, in the Last Supper, but there's a whole canvas like that. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> a, so he looks at it for a few minutes. He goes, "I see figures everywhere." <laughs> oh, interesting. So at that point, I gave up on <laughs> you know, you know, uh, uh, of of uh, of trying to find that uh, line between abstraction and and realism. Mm -hmm. So I figured it's something that. Uh, that I would play with, which I did later in my philosophies that I'm reading. Yeah. So, but uh, my, I did try to, I tried to encompass, a, by the time, in 1970, when these these were done, mm -hmm. I graduated and I was at Davis. Yeah. And and everybody at Davis, like uh, Bill Wiley, Tebow, yeah. Mary, Arneson, Roy Force. Uh, I was at that point where they were already there, where, where they, you could look at a painting, you could tell who did it. Mm -hmm. That's a wife, that's a husband. Yeah. So, you know, everybody had their voice. Right. I was looking for that in my work, searching for that in me. Uh -huh. 
That's and, awesome. Uh, so when I um, when I got there, there was this, the, in, and all of a sudden, I didn't have the uh, the um, the means to to uh, uh, to have a studio where I could work in oils. Mm -hmm. So I switched to acrylic. Okay. And and uh, one Sunday, I was standing there, and I was uh, I had a flat now. And one of the things that was my salary allowed me to do was no more roommates. Aha! <laughs> uh -huh. That's so, awesome. So I had my flat. So anyway, I decided that uh, it's time to explore acrylic and all the things, all the artists I didn't look at. Aha! Uh -huh. you know? So all the things I objected to or whatever. Now it was time to bring those into my life because teaching made me was also encouraged me to do that because I had students who had different ideas than sure. and so forth. And a different type of student went to Davis than went to the Art Institute. Right. So the concerns were different and the thoughts were different. And what was going on at Davis in terms of art making was different than it was at uh, the Art Institute. Yeah. So absolutely. I'm in there one Sunday afternoon. I had this roll of canvas, this ball of canvas that I bought, and I drew it into the oven for some reason and forgot about it, and it burnt. <laughs> oh, wow. And uh, then when I pulled, the fire truck shows up, somebody calls the fire truck, one of the neighbors in the building, and the fire, and I, and I, oh my God, what did I, you know, smoke coming from your place there, Mike, is there a fire up there? We got the fire truck here, and I said, yeah. no, uh, it's, uh, I left the iron on an ironing board. And by then, I pulled out the canvas, poured water on it, and laid it there. And then I came back later in the kitchen, and all of a sudden, I just felt all this inspiration from all these abstract shapes that had made the burn. They oh, how interesting. Ha. Huh. Began to work with some of those as they were, and some yeah. of them to cut up and make collages I love. Then eventually, I got back into color. It felt like color. I needed color. I started stretching, doing them on stretchers and so forth. And yeah. Because I didn't have storage. Mm -hmm. I always, but I always had this ability to do a lot of work. That's great. Yeah. I was talking to Bill Wiley at Davis about, you know, that, you know, he were, you're married and I had, have a studio. Well, he says, well, he, he worked in oils, but then through the, the, the situation, should also come into your life, yeah. To to be able to adjust to to keep making art. So he said he did it by mm -hmm. rolling up the work and stuff like that, and and he even start working with acrylic because it allowed him to do that. So I had to find a way to, like I said again, thinking about that whole thing, the tools and places doesn't matter if it's in you, the artist, the art will come out. You know. Yeah. And you don't need to define yourself as an, as an object or shape or whatever, you know, whatever it takes you. That's what I wanted to explore. Exactly. And, uh, and so the work began to change and, you know, it just begins to evolve. And I let it I let it organically take me to the next spot, you know, from the collage pieces. Yeah. To, to the then all of a sudden. Uh, uh, you know, making more money than I can. I get a place where I can work in oil. Yeah, awesome. Then the but the material changed, but I felt like oil was my voice. Uh huh. Like, like I wanted to be a drummer, but I had two left feet. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to be a singer, but I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. <laughs> yeah, awesome. But, hey, uh, uh, you just adjust to what you got, you know. Yeah. And uh, that's right was something that I learned from like these guys here, you yeah. know, artists yeah. who've been through that, those uh, personal uh, uh, voyages and, mm -hmm. you know, had their own sort of ways. So they all had different ways of, uh, of uh, um, Wiley was the first one I met. I eventually met Bob Hudson much later. Uh -huh. When I met Wiley, the first thing I asked him, I said, after the second week, I said, can you introduce me to Bob Hudson? Awesome. <laughs> I want to meet this guy, Bob Hudson. That's great. Bob Hudson. I mean, that was my mantra for, for a long time. When yeah. He was, he said, well, I don't know if he's around, but if a situation comes up, I'll let you know and so forth. Yep. 
That's but fantastic. We can, but, you know, it wasn't time to, you know, this and that. But next time, so anyway, then I remember Bill Allen, meeting Bill Allen. Uh, um, also, Wiley, I met him at school when I did my first film. Uh-huh. When I got the rushes back from the first film of footage ever shot with my camera with Bob Nelson. Okay. Got my first version of uh, the Last Supper and loaded the camera wrong, and uh, and uh, we were before class. I would get with Bob and he showed me how to do these things with the camera and whatever I needed to know. Never took a film class until much later. Yeah, and anyway, um, this guy Wiley was there, and he 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 was he was he would all of a sudden say uh, suggest something. As Bob was suggesting to me, well, you know, so you can also do that, and maybe this or that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So he said to me, um, so when I finally shot the film, I said, I'm going to do it over in color. And okay. So anyway, I got it a year later, shot it over in color. And he said, uh, my friend who was there with me the first time you met, uh, he wants to know, he'd like to see the film if you ever finish it. And I said, sure. So I eventually got it finished, told Bob I got it finished and so forth. And uh, anyway, make a long story short, uh, he says uh, he's coming to the, my film class and he wants to see if he can get some people come to Davis and show their film. He's going to pay $30. $30 is my rent. Oh, wow. Awesome. Uh -huh. Living in a flat with people from my room. So anyway, back in the 60s, I think the yeah. old for 175 in admission. <laughs> Anyway, uh, um, I had no idea he was scouting me out for Davis way back then. Awesome. Much later. And uh, then he told me about Bill Allen and his work and growing up with Hudson. They all three grew, grew up together. Yeah, right. An incredible teacher. Mm -hmm. Eventually I met and another guy, Michael Laybourne, who grew okay. up in a different environment. He was the... Uh, he was the blues lover. When I was going to school, I was playing a band called Johnny Mars Blues Band. Ah. This guy, he just got back from Vietnam and uh, and I would see him at this bar that we'd play every Sunday in Oakland called the Monkey's Paw, it was. Uh-huh. And um, anyway, much later, he was the guy who came up with Red Tail Ale and all of that oh, stuff. Oh, really? And all that, you know. Interesting. Long, like I said, again, it's just, it just, it just keeps on buying, on, winding you isn't know? that great yeah. though that's life <laughs> have a life like that is very blessed to watch it unfold and like i say meeting these guys and i saw the work of when i was graduating from the art institute one of the i was sort of like uh I used to go to the museum every sunday yeah i guess i was looking for you know uh this other thing like how do these these paintings are very uh important they're in a museum maybe they tell me what they got that i need for mine or something yeah i guess it was something psycho in my psyche back in the back that was driving me to the museum so one day i see this painting of his in the museum and of a ship with a big apple in it he told me a million times what the what the title of it is uh-huh you know I always called it self-improvement because it had something about that or something in it. Awesome. Uh, I remember just feeling excited about that painting, like, wow. Yeah. And uh, and then I got, you know, and that just stayed with me. Then it mm -hmm. sort of like bubbled out later. This yeah. Graduating on the day of graduating, getting my degrees. Awesome. That's Chris great. Martin, uh, who just passed away recently. Uh -huh. in, the boat in the background. Smiling like, I'm glad I got this guy out of the school here. <laughs> that is awesome. I can't oh, remember man. who the other guy who is who I'm shaking hands with, but yeah, uh, that was a big surprise. They also gave me this uh, that cup they give away that year, whatever. Oh yeah, uh huh. Surprise when that's and, fantastic. And the journey had come to an end here. Oh okay, yeah, sure. Uh huh. When it was down there. All of a sudden, it was like. You know, you're not in school anymore when I right. put paper and just like immediately or the whole psyche changed. Sure. Absolutely. 
I uh, I definitely want to. The place we got we got tore up. <laughs> got a bottle of uh, <clears throat> ruby port or something. Pour some lemon juice in. <laughs> oh man, had a great you know. So I, yeah, that's yeah, that's like the end of a of a chapter. You know, the beginning yes, of the next one. Yes, and it was uh, it was it was it was like a freight train coming down the track at you because all of a sudden, like, wow, what happens if you don't? But luckily, I had been offered a job at Davis by then. And I knew all that was going to happen in the fall, so I felt a, yeah, not secure. But but still, still a freight train like the freight train. Yeah, is that job going to only last a year, or am I going to? Yeah drew it up in some way because I'm so nuts. Oh, man. When I get to Davis and I found everybody just as nutty as I am. That's awesome. Why all, that's why they, my, my interview there was, 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 I didn't even know it was an interview when Wiley had me come up to show my film. Right. That's uh, great. That was, uh, then they kept calling me about the job and I kept turning it down because I did not want to leave San Francisco. Yeah. And I realized I kept the scholarship all the way through after my first year there. Uh-huh. And one thing about the scholarship I was that kept me going, I didn't want it to be uh, a, a minority scholarship. I wanted to compete for the scholarship that was offered to everyone. Got it, yeah. Because <laughs> I felt like um that scholarship for me being a country boy from the south i wasn't working hard enough for it aha uh -huh. you know that whole thing you know you you got to you, you got to make it on your own you yeah. gotta go for broke right so anyway i got the scholarship and and they assured me that it wasn't that one since i didn't take that scholarship they were able to bring in another minority student on that scholarship mm -hmm. so so anyway, uh, I felt confident, you know, this confidence building up to you because you realize, okay, sure. you got enough to get that and keep it all the way through. But I took out government loans because um, I, I was I was sending money back home, like when yeah. I got the, the, the from the accident, I sent you know, yeah, half, like the, or maybe part of it, more than not a half of it, but maybe like three or four hundred dollars of it back to my parents in Missouri because right. you know, so forth. But anyway, I was always doing stuff like that. So I'd That's sign great. anything that was uh was offered me money. So I figured, well, I gotta take the job and I can pay off these student loans and my school bill that awesome. <laughs> yeah. Store there at one time, you know. And I Yeah. I had yeah. a budget account, you know. Oh man. And That's I always made sure that the reason why it got so high, Fred was shocked when he saw it, was he said uh, that I that all my everybody who worked at the store I was always good friends with. <laughs> yeah, there you <laughs> yeah. go. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna pay it off eventually, you know. So I think it was like a couple thousand dollars when I had to pay off there, maybe uh ten grand in student loans and so forth. Right. And uh, which I paid all every penny of it back. There you, you know? go. That's fantastic. This is me over here with Sam at a party. Sam was always having parties. Not yeah, here. I wanted to ask yeah. you about that. <laughs> Sam but, was uh, Sam was my night person when I he taught night school there. Uh huh. And he would always give me a ride back to the mission and buy me buy me uh, a Chinese meal. He spoke Chinese. Right. Interesting. And, yeah. And, and and was the was the was the hustler from way back from mm -hmm. any rib joint you ever found. Sam was it, and I learned not to play pool with Sam for money because if you play pool with Sam, you played for money. Yeah, that's <laughs> I always, great. I always told him his table was tilted. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, where's the pedal that they push you to make your shots go in? Oh man, I know. that's <laughs> you know, awesome. Sam with both eyes. You know? Yeah, yeah. But that's what I loved about Sam. He was he was my idea of uh, closest I ever met to being uh, being a uh, uh, de Kooning or somebody like that. You know, yeah, the yep. mad painter. You know, the horse's mouth guy. You yep, know? that's right. Absolutely, and incredible studio. Lots of parties. Always good 
always interesting people and music, Sam yeah. music and so forth. Uh huh. And um, yeah, so uh, that's awesome. When he had a party, it was a big thing. When we got at Davis, it was manual Neri. So yeah, like, sure. Uh huh. That's fantastic. Well, that's great. Yeah, Sam was one of my instructors. Also, I knew yeah. I had to. I knew I had to have Sam's class before I yes. left the school. I just knew yes. it. So it's like, what the hell? What are you doing? What the hell are you doing? You think this is painting? Goddamn, this ain't nothing. Yeah. You got them done. That's right. When I heard him yeah. yelling at a graduate student, I knew that I had to experience that guy yeah, before yes, I left the school. Yes. So, uh, yes. but yeah, that's amazing. Too. That was one of my reasons too, because I was sort of like, I don't know about this guy, you know, because he, you know, he, he, yeah. he, he had a presence when he walked in, he, you know, he was like Rod Steiger or somebody. Right. Oh, man. And so I said, I got to. One thing I always liked about Sam, I always noticed his his shirts were always done by laundry. The collars were always starched. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you could be reading the racing form. Yeah. The racing form out there drinking coffee or whatever, you know. Oh man. You know? Yeah. I mean, there was nobody like Sam there. You know, it was like I said again, it was like everybody Davis. Nobody liked everybody. nobody like him. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it makes you feel comfortable when you know you're you're not the only nut in this world. You know? Exactly. Full of them. People uh, are not afraid to show their freak bag, you know, their freaky side. But uh, exactly. was, uh, was a great comrade. I had a lot of great arguments with him. And, you yeah, know, absolutely. So, screaming matches. Screaming matches. Oh. And, all too. and the thing that I liked about it after it was over, I'd always end up borrowing some money from him because I'm broke. Uh-huh. Uh, Bruce, can you lend me five bucks? Uh, Sam, can you lend me five bucks? Sure, you know. That's awesome. <laughs> you know, then the argument, you know, argument's over, you know. Now, yeah. Here's your money, you know, or something, or whatever. Oh, man, that's super cool. That this is super, is, that is super uh, cool. One of the first persons I ever met at the Art Institute, this is Helen Stanley. She uh -huh. Roger Jacobson down. He taught sculpture at the Art Institute at one time. But anyway, yeah. And uh, I was standing there at my first, like wondering what classes to take. And, and people were around. And I noticed her in the setting in the courtyard there on the fountain there. Yeah. Who that? So I got closer to the group of people to see what was what because she seemed to know it all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she became my, uh, my good friend and That's advisor, good. and uh, I would always ask. She was one of the people I was at the museum with when I had to write the paper about yeah the thing. Gosh, uh, That's her and her boyfriend at the time was this guy named Robert Combs. Anyway, That's great. Yeah. You know, awesome. We were buddies. We were, this is about taking out a wily opening. Uh huh. I, I don't don't see her that much every now and then. So every time I see Helen, it's always that's great. But you know, well, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, this is this has been fantastic. I uh, I I want to talk about this. I want to talk about this upcoming party here next week a little bit, and uh, that's going to be a big. A big fun thing, I feel. I'm hoping so. Got my fingers crossed. Yeah, I and luck, though, but I cross my fingers just out of courtesy. <laughs> abs absolutely. But, I'm. But, I, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna be playing music there, which I think is very exciting. Yeah, and the other thing, Diana Fuller um, um, asked me what I play and what I get to would get some other musicians the first thing i thought about were people who went to the school yeah first thing I thought about other than it was uh was a band that might have been there when you were there uh romeo void but I romeo couldn't, void yeah didn't contact any of those people i didn't know where they were none yeah. about it. but i uh, ran into uh, another woman um um penelope houston penelope yeah mm-hmm uh, it was in the band, the 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 Avengers. The Avengers, Avengers. yes. And uh, anyway, she's going to perform, and uh, Bill Wiley's son, Ethan Wiley. Ethan, yep. He plays music, filmmaker. Yeah, it's going to going to be great. And also Robert Nelson's son, uh, uh, Steve Nelson, who's a drummer. 
his jazz trio is going to play. They're going to awesome. open up and so forth. So then that's my group here. That's John Otis uh, on the in there, and, the, and that's John Rodstead there in the middle of the bass. Uh-huh. And of course, that's me. That's great. Out awesome. Saloon, the oldest, the old, the only blues club in San Francisco now where you can play blues. Oh wow! The only one that's the oldest. It's the oldest bar in in San Francisco, actually. It's wow. North, and of course, North Beach, uh, Grand Street, this is where it's at. Yeah, is uh, is, uh, is the home of the whole beat period. You know, sure, absolutely. But the place has been everything from. Um, Country Western to a biker to a rock club, now a blues club, now right. sort of like a, a anything music club, you know. It's, yeah. That's, there's like a whole variety there. That's awesome. Run by Myron, and uh, he's, he's uh, yeah. So you, you, every band, you, you come in there and you just you just play music, you know. Yeah. There's That's not, fantastic. Don't you know, need this. You know any of that? No. You know the people just want to hear music. Yeah. The cover chart. Awesome. So forth. Yeah, man. It's really well, lucrative, but it's the only game in town, and go yeah. find it, as you know. That's awesome. But well, here, it's going to be uh, to try to uh, to try to preserve the uh, the legacy of the art institute uh, and the archive, and uh, absolutely. Come out and check it out. Hope there's a lot of people from different uh, periods of the life of the artist too. Yes, it's you know to me it's still alive. The building mm-hmm. there and man, I I hate that it's closed and uh, all of that stuff. And mm-hmm. we on it because I was on the board of trustees when it when it ended. It's not something you want on your resume. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, well. Uh, but nobody does, but, uh, you know, bless his pointed head. Exactly. Got a, got, it's taking care of the legacy and Jeff Gunderson. And yeah, absolutely. Him and Diana Fuller, who sort of the spearhead of putting this event together and others behind her are helping out too and working with her. To yeah. Do this. And um, yeah, so uh, hopefully, hopefully a lot of people will show up. Show and, up. Yep. Well, I'm also just on the heel of this. This is how Bill Graham got it started. Aha. Uh-huh. Started at the Art Institute. The Mime Troop used to hang out there at our Art Institute, and Wiley and Bob Nelson and a bunch of other people used to make uh, backdrops for him. Oh, awesome. Jerry Garcia was at the was studied painting at the school with Wally Hedrick and Jay. Yeah. Fick. And anyway, um, um, uh, uh, they uh, the mine troop needed some uh, needed like a couple hundred bucks to mm-hmm. buy some, some material to make props for the they would do these political plays all through the city in the 60s. You'd find them at some yeah. time, sometime at the art institute, sometime wherever you know, at the demonstrations. Anyway, they do their performance and um. So anyway, uh, uh, Bill Graham was a part of that too, hanging around the artist too, too at that point. And um, anyway, uh, uh, Jerry Garcia tells him uh, that hey, uh, you want to make money for them? We got a band. We'll we'll play. So uh, so they found a place and they printed up like uh, I think like uh, I think he said like. Uh, couple hundred tickets sell them for a dollar each thing uh-huh. and it says like a thousand people showed up wow and next day uh, bill graham had a lease on all the buildings that would hold more than a thousand people wow that's and amazing him, and he also him and bob nelson were showing experimental films over in sausalito on the on the boat over there uh-huh that's where uh, Alan Watts used to do his talks on or something. Yeah. So anyway, they had this all sort of pivot from, I mean, the artist too was sort of like this nucleus that sort of conjured up all these things and this energy for these things to happen, you know? So uh, That's true. Absolutely. Nice if uh, enough people showed up where we could open up the school again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it has to be done grassroots, you know? Mm-hmm. Yes, people seem to be in fear of uh, 
giving money that it's going to go only go broke again and so forth. And yeah. So, well, I don't want to give my opinions on it, but if yeah. I had to say one thing real quick, I'd say go back to the basics. There you go. In photography. <laughs> go back to the basics. It's right. Go back to the basics. And, well, I'm I'm yeah. optimistic. You know, I'm I'm, I'm a I'm a optimistic pessimist. <laughs> there you go. Right. Yeah. Well, so, it's it's I'm great. Looking forward to Sunday and hoping to uh, uh, see some of the people that I saw. That maybe I can pay back some of the quarters I borrowed back then. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, that's different that's, photographers and so forth. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to meeting you in person. And um, this has been an excellent conversation. I really appreciate your participating and. Um, We'll just keep keep the uh, keep the spirit going. It's all we can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's you know the art institute. Like I say, to me, exists here inside of me, right here in my studio where I'm at. But it's a part of me now, and it's been, and no, that's something that uh, nobody can take away from me. You exactly. Know? Yeah. Right. It was like I'm. It's, there, it was so fertile, as you can tell by the conversation. I'm still I'm still picking from the fruit from that tree of being indeed that time, you know yeah indeed absolutely well yeah. who say that they didn't it wasn't for them mm. I they saw that and I hope they realized that it it showed them the place they should be because that's what I was counting on as too that type of experience I was asking for if if there's not an artist in me then I'll know what my next step is right okay you know which would have been okay bb king muddy waters jimmy hendrix here i come there you go absolutely <laughs> hang on the six a piece of wood with six strings on it which is just as uh ridiculous as putting paint on canvas <laughs> right when you think about you it. it down into verbals <laughs> exactly <laughs> but, yeah uh, that's awesome if that didn't work then i don't know I was. I knew I was going to go somewhere where, it's, where the sun shine. There you go. Mm -hmm. My African blood could be warm again. I was Indeed. through hard weather. <laughs> right. Right. Oh. Oh. And this is. It's been, a, it's been a great journey. It's been a pleasure talking to you and be able to. Oh, thank you. About some of this stuff. I wish I could get it in some sort of line where it could be compressed. But like I said again, I'm just riffing like I do when I play the guitar. I'm just exactly. Playing. Guitars are right back here, man. You know? <laughs> yes, yeah, I got my, <laughs> That's what, cool. My here. Yeah. It's also made by somebody who went to the artist. Too. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's awesome. Huh. Let's that's... go through there and they open up a music uh, repair, guitar repair shop. Now. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, uh, thank you, Mike. This has been excellent. And, you. Uh, you know, keep the faith. And uh, I appreciate your participation here. And uh, Ray. I want to say here. one thing. Yeah. The next step has been in my life was, was meeting Cheryl Haynes. Aha. So sometimes we can talk about from where the work is going now. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Don't wait 10 years. I don't know if I got that on my calendar, but <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully you do, you know. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. I don't well, know. I don't know if I want to live to be that old, you know. Yeah. But if I can't paint, I had my I had a knee transplant operation. I lay in hot in the bed for like a, a week or so. Yeah. So jacked up on medicines. Oh man. And I thought, Jesus, if this is what it's gonna be like being uh old, yeah. I want I want I want the peel. I want the shot. <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah. I want yeah. to say goodbye. I want to say I don't want to go out like this. Oh yeah. man, yeah. But uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. let's say again, the next chapter will be about uh, life in the gallery and how I got to the gallery and meeting Diana Fuller and Wanda Hanson and yeah, about the next step once you get the tenure job and you're right. Then having your students come, having students graduate and come back and yeah, successful and you see them and so forth. Right. It's, it's, like I said, it's still un unfolding. That's awesome. Well, maybe we'll do a part two someday, you know, yeah. and uh, maybe we'll do something 
in person. I've always wanted to do one of these in person now that COVID is kind of, you know, yeah. lightening up maybe in your studio or who knows what, you know, yeah, maybe I play the guitar. That would be fantastic. Yeah, I might have to bring my guitar then too. Yeah, we we'll, we'll, yeah we do a duet. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> Sing an old school song. <laughs> exactly. Oh, well, this is great. I'm gonna I'm gonna go now, and oh, um, we drink it here. <laughs> we will uh, we will see you next week. I'm looking forward to it, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Thomas. You're so welcome. You've been listening to Speaking of Art School, an oral history project created to perpetuate the culture and legacy of the San Francisco Art Institute. I'm your host, Thomas M. Houston. If you're an alumni of SFAI and would like to participate in this project, please contact me at thomasmhoustonartist at gmail.com. Please stay tuned for upcoming episodes, and as always, thanks for listening.